We're going to look at Calvin, John Calvin on prayer from the Institutes, chapter 20. Prayer, which is the chief exercise of faith and by which we daily receive God's benefits. The nature and value of prayer, one to three. Number one, faith and prayer. From those matters so far discussed, we clearly see how destitute and devoid of all good things man is and how he lacks all aids to salvation. Therefore, if he seeks resources to succor him in his need, he must go outside of himself and get them elsewhere. It was afterward explained to us that the Lord willingly and freely reveals himself in his Christ. For in Christ he offers all happiness in place of our misery, all wealth in place of our neediness. In him he opens to us the heavenly treasures that our whole faith may contemplate his beloved Son. Our whole expectations depend upon him and our whole hope cleave to and rest in him. This indeed is that secret and hidden philosophy which God, which cannot be wrestled from syllogisms. <clears throat> but they whose eyes God has opened surely learn it by heart that in, this, that in his light they may see light. Psalm 36.9 but after we've been instructed by faith to recognize that whatever we need and whatever we lack is in God and our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom the Father willed all the fullness of his bounty to, to abide, see Colossians 1.19, John 1.16, so that we may all draw from it as from an ever-flowing spring, it remains for us to seek in him and in prayers to ask of him what we have learned to be in him. Otherwise, to know God as the master and bestower of all good things, who invites us to request them of him. And still not to go to him and not ask of him, this would be of little profit, as for a man to neglect a treasure buried and hidden in the earth, after it had been pointed out to him. <coughs> Accordingly, the apostle, in order to show that true faith cannot be indifferent about calling upon God, has laid down this order, just as faith is born from the gospel, so through it our hearts are trained to call upon God's name. Romans 10, 14 to 17. And this is precisely what he has said a little before. The spirit of adoption who seals the witness of our gospel in our hearts, Romans 8, 16, raises up our spirits to dare show forth to God their desires, to stir up unspeakable groanings, Romans 8, 26, and confidently cry, Abba, Father, Romans 8, 15. Now we must more fully discuss this last point since it was previously only mentioned in passing and as it were curiously touched upon. Number two. The necessity of prayer. It is therefore by the benefit of prayer that we reach those riches which are laid up for us with the Heavenly Father. For this is a communion of men with God by which, having entered the heavenly sanctuary, they appeal to him in person concerning his promises in order to experience where necessity so demands that what they believed was not vain, and although he had promised it in word alone. Therefore we see that to us nothing is promised to be accepted from the Lord, which we are not also bidden to ask of him in prayers. So true is it that we dig up by prayer the treasures that were pointed out by the Lord's gospel, by which our faith is gazed upon. <clears throat> Words fail to explain how necessary prayer is, and in how many ways the exercise of prayer is profitable. Surely with good reason the Heavenly Father affirms that the only stronghold of safety is calling upon his name. See Joel 2.32. By so doing, we invoke the presence both of his providence, through which he watches over and guards our affairs, and of his power, through which he sustains us, weak as we are, and well nigh overcome, and of his goodness, through which he receives us, miserably burdened with sins unto grace. And in short, it is by prayer that we call him to reveal himself as wholly present to us. <coughs> Hence comes an, or an ordinary, extraordinary peace and repose to our consciences, for having disclosed to the Lord the necessity that was pressing upon us, we even rest fully in the thought that none of our ills is hid from him, who we are convinced has both the will and the power to take the best care of us. Number three, objections. Is prayer not surproofless? Six reasons for it. But someone will say, does not God know even without being reminded both in and what respects we are troubled and what is expedient for us so that we may seem in a sense, it may seem in a sense superfluous that he should be stirred up by our prayers? as if he were drowsily blinking or even sleeping until he was aroused by our voice. But they who thus reason do not observe to what end the Lord instructs his people to pray, 
for he ordained it not so much for his own sake as for ours. <clears throat> now he wills, is it right, that his due be rendered to him. In the recognition that everything men desire and account conducted to their own profit comes from him. And in the attestation of this by prayers. But the profit of the sacrifice also by which he is worshipped returns to us. Accordingly, the Holy Fathers, the more confidently they extol God's benefits among themselves and others, were the more keenly aroused to pray. It will be enough for us to note the single example of Elijah, who by God's purpose, after he is deliberately promised reign by to King Elijah, Ahab still anxiously prays with his head between his knees and sends his servant seven times to look. 1 Kings 18.42 Not because he would discredit his prophecy, but because he knew it was his duty, lest, by faith, lest his faith be sleepy or sluggish to lay his desires before God. Therefore, even though while we grow dull and stupid toward our miseries, he watches and keeps guard on our behalf, and sometimes even helps us unasked. Still, it is very important for us to call upon him. First, that our hearts may be fired with a zealous and burning desire to seek, love, and serve him. <clears throat> While he become accustomed in every need to flee to him as to a sacred anchor. Secondly, that there may, may enter our hearts no desire and no wish at all of which we should be ashamed to make him a witness. While we learn to set all our wishes before his eyes and even to pour out our whole hearts. Thirdly, that we were prepared to receive his benefits with true gratitude of heart and thanksgiving. Benefits that our prayers remind us of come from his hand. See Psalm 145, 15 to 16. Fourthly, moreover, that having obtained what we were seeking and being convinced that he has answered our prayers, we should be led to meditate upon his kindness more ardently. And fifthly, that at the same time we embrace with greater delight those things which we acknowledge to have been obtained by prayers. Finally, that the use and experience may, according to the measure of our feebleness, confirm his providence, while we understand not only that he promises never to fail us, and if his own will opens the way to call upon him at the very point of necessity, but also that he never that he ever extends his hand to help his own, not witnessing them with words, but defending them with present help. On account of these things, our most merciful Father, although he never either sleeps or idles, still very often gives us the impression of one sleeping or idling in order that he may thus train us, otherwise idle and lazy, to seek, ask, and entreat him to our great good. Therefore, <clears throat> they act with excessive foolishness, who, to call men's minds away from prayer, babble that God's providence standing guard over us is vainly importuned with our entreaties, inasmuch as the Lord has not, on the contrary, vainly attested that he, he is near to all who call upon his name in truth, Psalm 145.18. Quite like this is what others prat, that it is superfluous to them to petition the things that the Lord is gladly ready to bestow, while those very things which flow to us from his voluntary liberality, he should have us recognize as granted to our prayers. That memorable saying of the psalm attests this, and to it many similar passages correspond. For the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears toward their prayers. 1 Peter 3.12, Psalm 34.15, C. 33.16. This sentence so comprehends the providence of God, intent as is in accord with caring for the salvation of the godly, as yet not to admit the exercise of faith by which men's minds are cleansed of indolence. The eyes of God are therefore watchful to assist the blind in their necessity, but he is willing to turn to hear our groanings, that he may better prove his love toward us. And so both are true, that the keeper of Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps, Psalm 121.4, and yet <clears throat> that he is inactive, as if forgetting us, when he, he sees us idle and mute. The rules of right prayer, 4 to 16. First rule, reverence, 4 to 5. Number 4, <clears throat> devout attachment required for conversation with God. Now, for framing prayer duly and properly, let this be the first rule, that we be disposed in mind and heart as befits those who enter conversation with God. This we shall indeed attain with respect to the mind, if it is freed from carnal cares and thoughts by which it can be called or led away from right and pure contemplation of God. And then not only devotes itself completely to prayer, but also, insofar as this is possible, is lifted and carried beyond itself. Now, I do not here require the mind to be so detached as never to be pricked or gnawed by vexation, since, on the contrary, great anxiety should kindle us in the desire to pray. Thus we see that God's saintly servants give proof of huge torments, not to say vexations when they speak of uttering their 
plaintive cry to the Lord from the deep abyss and from the very jaws of death. See Psalm 130, verse 1. But I say that we are rid to rid ourselves of all alien and outside cares by which the mind itself, a wanderer, is borne about hither and thither, drawn away from heaven, pressed down to earth. I mean that it ought to be raised above itself, that it may not bring that it may not bring into God's sight anything our blind and stupid reason is wont to devise, nor hold itself within the limits of its own vanity, but rise to a purity worthy of God. Number five. five. <clears throat> Again, undisciplined and irreverent prayer. These two matters are worth attention. First, whoever engages in prayer should apply to it his faculties and efforts, and not, as commonly happens, be distracted by wandering thoughts. For nothing is more contrary to reverence for God than the levity that marks an excess of frivolity utterly devoid of awe. In this matter, the harder we find concentration to be, the more strenuously we have to labor after it. For no one is intent on praying that he does not feel any many irrelevant, irrelevant thoughts stealing upon him, which of course break the course of prayer or delay it by some winding bypath. But let us recall how unworthy it is when God admits us to intimate conversation to abuse this great kindness by mixing sacred and profane. But just as if the great discourse were between us and an ordinary man, amidst our prayers we neglect him and flit about hither and thither. Let us therefore realize that the only persons who duty and properly gird themselves to prayer are those who are so moved by God's majesty that freed from earthly cares and affections, they come to it. And the right of rising the hands means that men remember they are far removed from God unless they raise their thoughts on high. As it is also said in the psalm, this is from 25.1, to thee I have lifted my soul, Psalm 25.1. And scripture quite often uses this expression to lift up prayer, for example, Isaiah 37.4, in order that those who wish God to hear them may not settle down on their lees. See Jeremiah 48.11, Zephaniah 1.12. In short, <clears throat> the more generously God deals with us, gently summoning us to unburden our cares into his bosom, the less excusable are we if his splendid and incomparable benefit does not outweigh all else with us and draw us to him, so that we apply our minds and efforts zealously to prayer. This cannot happen unless the mind stoutly wrestled with these hindrances rises above them. We have noted another point, not to ask any more than God allows, for even though he bids us pour out our hearts before him, Psalm 62, 8, see Psalm 145, 19, he still does not indiscriminately slacken the reins to stupid and wicked emotions. And while he promises that he will act according to the will of the godly, his gentleness does not go so far that he yields to their willingness. Yet in both, men commonly sin gravely, for many rashly, shamelessly, and irreverently dare importune God with their improprieties and imprudently present before his throne whatever in dreams has struck their fancy. But such great dullness or stupidity gives them that they dare not thrust upon God all their vilest desires, which they should be deeply ashamed to acknowledge to men. Certain profane offers make fun of, and even detested this effrontery, <coughs> but the vice itself has always held sway. And hence it came to pass, the ambitious men chose Jupiter in their patron, and miserly Mercury. Those greedily for knowledge, Apollo and Minerva, the warlike Mars, the lecherous Venus, and so today, as I have just suggested, men in their prayers grant more license to their unlawful desires than if equals their jestingly to gossip with equals. Yet God does not allow his gentle dealing to be thus mocked, but claiming his own right, he subjects our wishes to his power and bridles them. For this reason, we must hold fast to, hold fast to John's statement. 1 John 5, 14, this is the confidence we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. The Holy Spirit aids right prayer. <clears throat> But because our abilities are far from able to match such perfection, we must seek a remedy to help us. We must learn keenness of mind toward God, so affection of heart has to follow. Both indeed stand far beneath, nay, more truly, they faint and fail, or are carried in the opposite direction. Therefore, in order to minister to this weakness, God gives us the Spirit as our teacher in prayer, to tell us what is right and temper our emotions. For, because we do not know how to pray as we ought, the Spirit comes to our help and intercedes for us with unspeakable groans. Romans 8, 26. Not that he actually prays or groans, but arouses in his assurance, desires, and sighs to conceive, which are natural powers which scarcely suffice. And Paul, with good reason, calls unspeakable those groans which believers give forth under the guidance of the Spirit. For they who are truly trained in prayers are not unmindful that perplexed by blind anxieties, 
they are so constrained as scarcely to find out what is expedient for them to utter. Indeed, when they try to stammer, they are confused and hesitate. <coughs> Clearly, then, to pray rightly is a rare gift. These things are not said in order that we, favoring our own slothfulness, may give over the function of prayer to the Spirit of God and vegetate in that carelessness to which we are all too prone. In this strain, we hear the impious voices of certain persons saying that we should drowsily wait until we overtake our preoccupied minds. But rather, our intention is that, loathing our inertia and dullness, we should seek such aid of the Spirit. And indeed, Paul, when he enjoins us to pray in the Spirit, 1 Corinthians 14, 15, does not stop urging us to watchfulness. He means that the prompting of the Spirit empowers us so to compose our prayers as by no means to hinder or hold back our own effort, since in this matter God's will is to test how effectively faith moves our hearts. Second rule. We pray from a sincere sense of want and with penitence. Six and seven. Six. The sense of need that excludes all unreality. Let this be the second rule that in our prayers we ever sense our own insufficiency and earnestly pondering how we need all that we seek, joining with this prayer an earnest, nay, burning desire to attain it. <clears throat> For many perfunctorily intoned prayers after a set form as if to charging a duty to God. And although they admit it to be necessarily a remedy for their ills, because it would be fatal to lack the help of God from which they are beseeching, still it appears that they perform this duty from habit, because their hearts are meanwhile cold and they do not ponder what they ask. Indeed, a general and confused feeling of their need leads them to prayer, but it does not arouse them, as it were in present reality, to seek the relief of their poverty. Now, what do we account more hateful or more execrable to God than the friction, than the fiction of someone asking pardon for their sins, I all the while either thinking he is not a sinner, or at least not thinking he is a sinner? unquestionably something in which God himself is mocked. Yet, as I have just said, mankind is so stifled, is so stuffed with such depravity, that for the sake of mere performance, men often beseech God for many things, that they are dead, sure will, apart from his kindness, come to them from some other source already lie in their possession. A fault that seems less serious, but is also not terrible, is that of others who, having been imbibed with this one principle, that God must be appeased by devotions, mumble prayers without meditation. Now, the godly must particularly beware of presenting themselves before God to request anything unless they yearn, for it is with sincere affection of heart and at the same time desire to obtain it from him. Indeed, even though in those things which we seek only to God's glory, we do not seem at first glance to be providing for our own need, yet it is fitting that they be sought with no less ardor and eagerness. When, for example, we pray that his name be sanctified, Matthew 6, 9, Luke 11, 2, we should, so to speak, eagerly hunger and thirst after that sanctification. <clears throat> Number seven. Is prayer at times dependent on our passing mood? If anyone should object that we are not always urged with equal necessity to pray, I admit it. And to our benefit, James gives us, a, gives us this distinction. Is anyone among you sad? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing. James 5.13. Therefore, common sense itself dictates that because we are too lazy, God picks us the more sharply pricks us the more sharply, as occasion demands to pray earnestly. David calls this a seasonable time, Psalm 32, 6, 30, 31, 6, Vulgate, because as he teaches in many other passages, for example, Psalm 94, 19, the more harshly troubles, discomforts, fears, and trials of other sorts press us, the freer is our access to him, as if God were summoning us to himself. At the same time, Paul's statement is no less true that we must pray at all times, Ephesians 6, 18, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. For however much alt... After our heart's desire, affairs may preposterously flow and occasion for happiness surround us on all sides. Still, there is no point of time when our needs does not urge us to pray. A certain man has abundant wine and grain. Since he cannot enjoy a single morsel of bread apart from God's continuing favor, his wine cellars and granaries will not hinder him from praying for his daily bread. Now, if we should consider how many dangers at every moment threaten, fear itself will teach us that we at no single time may leave off praying. Still, we can better recognize the fact in spiritual matters. For when, <clears throat> for when should the many sins of which we are conscious allow us nonchalantly to stop praying as supplicants for pardon of our guilt and penalty? When do temptations yield us a truce from hastening after help? Moreover, zeal for the kingdom of God and his glory ought to so lay hold on us, not intermittently, but constantly, that the same opportunity may ever remain ours. 
It is therefore not in vain that constancy and prayers are joined upon us. I am not yet speaking of perseverance, of which I will mention, mention will be made later. But Scripture, admonishing us to pray constantly, 1 Thessalonians 5.17, accuses us of sloth, for we do not realize how much we need this attentiveness and constancy. By this rule, hypocrisy and wily falsehoods toward God are debarring from prayer. Indeed, are banishing far away, are banished far away. God promises that he, will, he, that he will be near to all who call upon him in truth. Psalm 145, 18. And states that those who seek him with all their heart will find him. Jeremiah 29, 13 to 14. For this reason, they who delight in their own fondness aspire not at all. Lawful prayer, therefore, demands repentance. Hence arises the commonplace in Scripture that God does not hearken to the wicked. John 9, 31. And that their prayers... See Proverbs 28, 9, Isaiah 1, 15, just as their sacrifices, see Proverbs 15, 8, and 21, 27, are an abomination to him. For it is right that those who bar their hearts should find God's ears closed. And they who by their hard-heartedness provoke his severity should not feel him conciliatory. In Isaiah, he threatens in this way. Isaiah 1, 15, even though you multiply your prayers, I will not listen, for your hands are full of blood. Again in Jeremiah, this is Jeremiah 7, 11, 7, and 8 and 11. I cried out, and they refused to listen. They will cry out in return, and I will not listen. <clears throat> for he counts at the height of dishonor for wicked men, who all their lives be smirch his sacred name, to boast of his covenant. Consequently, in Isaiah, he complains when the Jews draw near to them with their lips. Their hearts are far from him, Isaiah 29, 13. He does not need his indeed restrict his prayers alone, but declares their falsity in any way part of the wor of his worship is abhorrence to him. That statement of James applies here. You seek, but you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions, James 4, 3. It is indeed true, as we shall again see a, a little later, that the prayers poured out by the godly do not depend upon their worthiness. Yet John's warning is not superfluous. We receive of him whenever we ask because we keep his commandments, 1 John 3.22 while a bad conscience closes the door to us. From this it follows that not only sincere worshipers of God pray aright and are heard, that only sincere worshipers of God pray aright and are heard. Let each one, therefore, as he prepares to pray, be displeased with his own evil deeds. And something that cannot happen without repentance, let him take the person and disposition of a beggar. Third rule. We yield all confidence in ourselves and humbly plead for pardon, 8 to 10. Eight, we come as humble supplicants for mercy. To this let us join a third rule, that anyone who stands before God to pray in his humility giveth glory completely to God. <clears throat> Abandon all thought of his own glory. Cast off all notion of his own worth. In fine, put away all self-assurance, lest, lest we claim for ourselves anything, even the least bit. We should become vainly puffed up and perish at his presence. We have repeated examples of the submission which levels all haughtiness in God's servants, each of whom the holier he is, the more he is cast down when he presents himself before the Lord. Thus spoke Daniel, whom the Lord himself commanded with so great a title. We do not pour forth our prayers unto thee on the ground of our righteousness, but on the ground of thy great mercy, O Lord. Hear us, O Lord, be kindly unto us. Hear us, and do, not, and do what we ask for thine own sake, because thy name is called upon over thy people and over thine holy place. Daniel 9, 18-19. Nor does he by devious figure of speech, as some men do, mingle with the, with the crowd as one of the people. Rather, he confesses his guilt as an individual, and as a supplicant takes refuge in God's pardon, as he elo eloquently declares, When I had confessed my sin and the sin of my people, Daniel 9.20. David also enjoys this humility by his own example. Psalm 143.2 Enter not into judgment with thy servant, for no man living is righteous before thee. In such a form Isaiah prays, Behold, thou wert wroth, for we sinned. The world is founded upon thy ways, therefore we shall be saved. And all of us have been full of uncleanness, and all our righteousness is like a filthy rag. We have faded like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, scatter us. There is no one who calls upon thy name, who bestirs himself to take hold of thee. For thou hast hid thy face from us, and hast made us to melt away in the hand of our iniquities. Yet, O Lord, thou art our Father. We are the clay. Thou art our potter. We are the work of thy hand. Be not angry, O Lord, and remember, remember not iniquity forever. 
Behold now, consider, we are thy people. Isaiah 64, 5 to 9. Observe that they depend on no assurance whatsoever but this alone, that reckoning themselves to be of God, they do not despair that he will take care of them. Likewise, Jeremiah, this is 14, 7, Though our iniquities testify against us, act for thy name's sake. For some unknown author, whoever he may be, has written that these very true and holy words attributed to the prophet Baruch, the soul that is sorrowful and desolate for the greatness of her evil, bow down and feeble. The hungry soul, the eyes that fail, give glory to thee, O Lord. It is not for the righteousness of the fathers that we pour out our prayers before thee and beg mercy in thy sight, O Lord our God. Baruch 2, 18 to 19. I'm assuming that's from the uh, Apocrypha. But because thou art merciful, be merciful unto us, for we have sinned before thee. Baruch 3, 2. Number nine. The plea for forgiveness of sins as the most important part of prayer. To sum up, the beginning and even the preparation of proper prayer is the plea for pardon with a humble and sincere confession of guilt. Nor should anyone, however holy he may be, hope that he will obtain anything from God until he is freely reconciled to him. Nor can God chance to be propitious toward any but those whom he has pardoned. Accordingly, it is no wonder if believers open for themselves the door to prayer with this key, as we learn from numerous passages of the Psalms. For David, asking for something else that then remission of sin says, remember not the sins of my youth and my transgressions. According to thy mercy, remember me for thy goodness sake, O Lord. Psalm 25, 7. Again, see my affliction in my soul and forgive me all my sins. Psalm 25, 18. Also in this, we see that it is not enough for us to call ourselves to account each day for recent sins, if we do not remember those sins, which might seem to have been long forgotten. For the same prophet elsewhere, having confessed one grave offense on this occasion, even turns back to his mother's womb, in which he had contracted the infection, Psalm 51.5. Not just to extenuate the guilt on the ground of corruption of nature, but that in gathering up the sins of his whole life, the more rigorously he condemns himself, the more easily entreated he may find God. But even though the saints do not always beg forgiveness of sins in so many words, if we diligently ponder their prayers that scripture relates, we shall readily come upon what I speak of. <clears throat> that they have received their attention to pray from God's mercy alone. And thus have always begun with appeasing him. Or if anyone should question his own conscience, he would be so far from daring intimately to lay aside his cares before God unless he relied upon mercy and pardon. He would tremble at every approach. There is also another special confession with supplants, ask release from punishments is that at the same time they may pray for the pardon of their sins. For it would be absurd to wish the effect to be removed while the cause remained. We must guard against admitting foolish sick folly. We must guard against imitating foolish sick folk who concerning solely with the treatment of torments neglect the very root of the disease. We must make it first our concern that God be favorable toward us rather than he attests his favor by outward signs because he wills to maintain this order and would have been of small profit to us to have him do us good unless our conscience, feeling him wholly appeased, render him altogether lovely. Canticles 5.16 Christ's reply also reminds us of this, for after he had declared to heal the paralytic, your sins, he said, are forgiven you. Matthew 9.2 He thus arouses our minds to, act to that which we ought especially to desire, that God may receive us into grace. Then, that in abiding he may set us forth the fruits of reconciliation. But besides that special confession of present guilt, which, with which believers plead for the remission of every sin and penalty, the general preface that gains favor for prayers must never be passed over. For unless they are founded in free mercy, prayers never reach God. John's statement can be applied to this. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 1.9 for this reason, under the law, prayers had to be consecrated with blood atonement. See Genesis 12, 8, 26, 25, 33, 20, 1 Samuel 7, 9. <clears throat> In order that they should be accepted, and that the people should thus be warned that they were unworthy of so great a privilege of honor until purged of their defilement, they derived confidence in prayer solely from God's mercy. Number 10. Reference to one's own righteousness. Now, the saints sometimes seem to shout approval of their own righteousness in calling upon God for help. For example, David says, Keep my life, for I am good. Psalm 86, 2. And similarly, Hezekiah, Remember, O God, I beseech thee, how I have walked before thee in truth and have done what is good in thy sight. 2 Kings 20, 
verse 3. Isaiah, see Isaiah 38, 3. But such expressions, they mean nothing else but that by their regeneration itself, they are attested as servants and children of God, to whom he promises that he will be gracious. He teaches to the prophet, as we have already seen, that his eyes are upon the righteous, his ears toward their prayers. Psalm 3415, C 3316. Again, through the apostle, through the apostle John, we, re we shall receive whatever we ask if we keep his commandments. 1 John 3.22. In these statements, he does not set the value of prayer according to the merits of work, but he is pleased to establish the assurance of those who duly awake or are duly aware of guileless uprightness and innocence, as all believers ought to be. Indeed, that the blind man whose sight was restored says in John's Gospel that God does not listen to sinners, John 9.31, has been drawn away from the very truth of God, provided we understand sinners and the customary usage of Scripture, as all persons who slumber and repose in their own sins without any desire for righteousness. For no heart can ever break into sincere calling upon God that does not at the same time aspire to godliness. To such promises then correspond the saints' attestations, in which they mention their purity or innocence in order that they may feel <coughs> that what all God's servants should hope for, make manifest to themselves. Again, while they are before the Lord comparing themselves with their enemies, from whose iniquity they long to be delivered by his hand, they are commonly found using this sort of prayer. Now, it is no wonder if in this comparison they put forward their own righteousness and simplicity of heart in order that, from the equity of the cause itself, they might the more move the Lord to provide them with assistance. The godly man enjoys a pure conscience before the Lord, thus confirming himself in the promises which the Lord's comforts and supports his true worshipers. It is not our intent to snatch this blessing from the, his breast. Rather, we would assert that this, his assurance, that this, that, his assurance, his prayers will be answered rest solely upon God's clemency, apart from all consideration of personal merit. Fourth rule, we pray with confident hope, 11 to 14. 11, hope and faith overcome fear. The fourth rule is that thus cast down and overcome by true humility, we should be nonetheless encouraged to pray by a pure, a sure hope that our prayer will be answered. These are indeed things apparently contrary to join the firm assurance of God's favor to a sense of just vengeance. Yet, in the other, yet on the ground that God's goodness alone rises up, those oppressed by their own evil deeds, they very well agreed together. For in accordance with our previous teaching that repentance and faith are companions joined together by an indissolvable bond, although one of these terrifies us while the other glands us, so also these two ought to be present together in prayers. And David briefly expresses this agreement when he says, I through the abundance of thy goodness will enter thy house. I will worship toward the temple of thy holiness with fear. Psalm 5, 7. Under God's goodness, he includes faith. Meantime, not excluding fear. For not only does his majesty constrain us to reverence, but through our own unworthiness, forgetting all pride and all self-confidence, we are held in fear. <clears throat> but assuring... Assurance, I do not understand to mean that which soothes our mind in sweet, with sweet and perfect repose, releasing it from every anxiety. For to repose so peacefully is a part of those who, when all affairs are flowing to their liking, are touched by no care, burnt with no desire, tossed with no fear. But for the saints, the occasion that best stimulates them to call upon God is when, distressed by their own need, they are troubled by the greatest unrest and are almost driven out of their senses until faith opportunely comes to their relief. For amongst its tribulations, God's goodness so shines upon them that even they groan with weariness under the weight of present ills and are also troubled and tormented by the fear of greater ones. Yet relying upon his goodness, they are relieved of the difficulty of bearing them and are solaced in hope for escape and deliverance. It is fitting, therefore, that the godly man's prayer arise from these two emotions that it also contain and represent both. That is, that he groan under the present ills and anxiety, fear those to come, yet at the same time take refuge in God, not at all doubting he is ready to extend his helping hand. It is amazing how much our lack of trust provokes God if we request him a boon that we do not expect. Faith and prayer. Excuse me, prayer and faith. <clears throat> Therefore, nothing is more in harmony with the nature of prayers that this rule be laid down and established for them, that they break not forth by chance, but follow faith as God. Christ calls this principle to attention of all of us with this saying, I say unto you, whatever you ask, believe that you will receive it, and it will come to you. Mark eleven twenty four. He affirms the same statement in another place, whatever you ask in prayer, believing. 
Matthew 21, 22. James is in accord with this. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God, who gives to all men simply and without reproaching. Let him ask in faith with no wavering. James 1, 5 to 6. There opposing faith the wavering, he most appropriately expresses the force of faith. Nonetheless, what he adds must also be noted, that they who in doubt are in perplexity call upon God, and certain in their minds whether they will be heard or not, will gain nothing. See James 1, 7. He even compares these persons to waves that are driven and tossed about, hither, hither and thither by the wind, James 1, 6. Hence, in another passage, James calls what is right and proper the prayer of faith, James 5, 15. Then since God so often affirms that he will give to each one according to his faith, Matthew 8, 13, 9, 29, Mark 11, 24, he implies that we can obtain nothing apart from faith. <clears throat> to sum up, it is with faith that obtains whatever is granted to prayer. Such is the meaning of Paul's famous statement, which the unwise uh, too little regard. Romans 10, 14. How will anyone call upon him in whom he has not believed? And who will believe unless he has heard? Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, from the word of God. For deducing step by step the beginning of prayer from faith, he plainly asserts that God cannot be sincerely called upon by others than those to whom, through the preaching of the gospel, his kindness and gentle dealing have become known indeed, have been intimately revealed. 12. Against the denial of certainty that prayer is granted. Our opponents do not at all ponder this requirement. Therefore, when we enjoin believers to be convinced with firm assurance of mind that God is favorable and benevolent to them, they think we are saying the most absurd thing of all. Still, if they make any use of true prayer, the most absurd thing, uh, still they make use of prayer, uh, God is favorable and benevolent to them. They think we are saying the most absurd thing of all. Still, if they made any use of true prayer, they would really understand that without that firm sense of the divine beneficence, God could not be rightly called upon. Since no one can well perceive the power of faith unless he feels it by experience in his heart, what point is there in arguing with men of the stripe who clearly show that they have never had anything but an empty imagination? For the value and need of that assurance, which we require, is chiefly learned from calling upon him. He who does not see this shows that he is very insent, has a very insensate conscience. Let us then pass over this class of blind persons and cleave firmly to the statement of Paul's. God cannot be called upon by any except those who have learned of his mercy from the gospel, Romans 10.14, and have surely been persuaded that it has been prepared for them. Now, what sort of prayer will this be? O oh Lord, I am in doubt whether thou willest to hear me, but because I am pressed by anxiety, I flee to thee, that if I am worthy, thou mayest help me. This is not the way of all the saints whose prayers we read in Scripture. And the Holy Spirit did not so instruct us through the Apostle, who enjoins us to draw near to the heavenly throne with confidence that we may receive grace. And when he teaches elsewhere that we have boldness and access and confidence through faith in Christ, Ephesians 3.12, if we should pray fruitfully, we ought therefore to grasp with both hands this assurance of obtaining what we ask, which the Lord enjoins with his own voice, and all the saints teach by their example. For only that prayer is acceptable to God which is born, if I may so express it, out of such presumption of faith, and is grounded in unshaken assurance of hope. He could have been content with a simple mention of faith, yet he not only out of conscience, but also fortitude, fortifieth it with freedom of boldness, that it may mark, that by this mark he might distinguish it from the unbelievers, who indeed indiscriminately mingle with us in our prayers to God, but by chance. The whole church prays in this way in the psalm, Let thy mercy be upon us, even as we have hoped in thee. Psalm thirty-three twenty-two. Elsewhere the prophet lays down the same condition. In the day when I call, this I know, that God is with me. Psalm 56, 9. Likewise, Psalm 5, 3. In the morning I will make ready for thee and watch. From these words we conclude that prayers are vainly cast upon the air unless hope be added, from which we quietly watch for God as from a watchtower. Paul's other exhortation agrees with these, for before he urges believers to pray at all times in the spirit and watchfulness and perseverance, Ephesians 6.18, he bids them first take up the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And I'll stop there. But uh, boy, great, great amazing teaching from John Calvin. We uh, should take all of this deeply to heart. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for your beloved servant, Calvin. 
burn these truths into our mind, for we do not pray as often as we should and as deeply as we should. Give us a desire to seek Thee in prayer, Lord. Approach the throne of grace of your dear Son, Jesus Christ. We have confidence that even though we are sinners and unacceptable in your sight, in Christ we are fully acceptable. And we can come with boldness before your throne and pray according to your will. In Jesus' name, amen.